Hey everyone, welcome to another podcast uh, on Deep Dive on University. In this video, we are going to, we are going to learn about UMBC uh, from Paul, who pursued his master's in computer science uh, from there, right? But before we do that, uh, I would love to hear a little bit about you from you, Paul. Uh, thanks, Nitin. Thanks for having me here. Um, it's a pleasure to convey uh, everything that I've learned to your audiences. Um, I am Paul Samson Ledala. So uh, I did my master's in computer science from University of Maryland, Baltimore County um, in Baltimore. And um, after right now, I'm in my job search, um, looking for a job in software engineering. Prior to this, I also worked at Deloitte Consulting um, as a software engineer for a an year and a couple of internships that I did. Um, so that's about me. That's great. That's great. So now uh, one of the first things generally people do when they start their journey is uh, making a list of your cities right uh, and preparing their profile for that right so what was your profile like what was your gre score TOEFL score or any other uh, exams that you had taken and mm -hmm. then secondly what is the list of cities that you made right so um i got a gre score of 320 um, I, I didn't go to any coaching center um, and I prepared on my own. My TOEFL score was around 107. Um, and for uh, as for the universities that I applied, I applied to Michigan State University. I applied to Northeastern University. Um, I also applied to UMBC and um, a couple of safe colleges that I thought I would definitely get into. And I apply, also applied to UTA, um, University of Texas at Austin. Um, yeah, these were my universities, about like six to seven universities in total. Got it. Got it. And out of these seven universities, uh, did you, I'm pretty sure you might have got few admits. Mm -hmm. So what was your thought process? Uh, first, like which admits did you get? And second, yeah. what was your thought process to shortlist one of them? Um, so... Uh, as predicted, I got both of my safe universities um, and I also got at UMBC and Northeastern came back to me saying, um, because you did your undergrad in information technology, like you might have to take requirements for computer science. So we might not um, give you the computer science degree, but we want you to apply for information um, systems. Um, and so I applied for the IS course um, in Northeastern and I got it there too. So I got like Northeastern IS course, UMBC CS, and a couple of safe universities that I uh, had in mind. Um, and my thought process was only between UMBC and Northeastern University. Of course, Northeastern was a great, like uh, in a great location. It's in Boston. Um, where all the tech comp healthcare companies are. Um, and then um, it was information systems course. And then University of Maryland had this um, computer science course, which was I was more interested in. So at the end, I felt like I wanted to take computer science. So I took University of Maryland. Got it. Got it. Uh, that is good. I think that is how generally people will look for uh, as well so that is great now uh, uh, the first thing that people generally do once they shortlist the university is uh, obviously they will probably start preparing for uh, going to masters at that particular university so let's say in your case it is UMBC so when you shortlisted UMBC just for the viewers to make a mental note what were those three or four points or two points which you felt okay since UMBC has these three things I feel I should go with UMBC mm -hmm. um, it can be scholarship it can be uh, let's say a good ROI or a good course yes. good on-campus jobs anything but what was those what were those things for you um so my pros for the university was that it has like a great syllabus. You don't have a lot of core courses to take. You just have a three core courses and all the others were electives that you could basically choose. Um, out of like 11 courses, I could choose eight, which I, I felt like I had the choice and the direction that I want to take my career in. That was a pro for me. Um, 
and of course the professors um, that come with this course, uh, these courses. Then the second one would be the return on investment. Obviously, the ROI is really good um, at UMBC. Like um, we can go into it, the details later, but um, the cost of living is kind of low in Baltimore. Um, and the university is at a great, uh, a nice location. It has an Indian community around the um, college. And the third one is basically the Indian community. There are a lot of people who take these courses. It feels like homely once you come to the university. There are a lot of mentors that can guide you in the right direction, um, whether you're doing it right or if, if you need to improve on something. Got it. Makes sense. Makes sense. So yeah. uh, now moving on to the next question, which is about uh, once you land here, one of the first things that you will try to figure out is living, right? So what yeah. are those areas or what are those communities, uh, if you could name a few, around uh, University UMBC, which people generally prefer, Indian students uh, prefer, um, and what is what would be your recommendation from those? Yeah. So um, I would definitely recommend a community called uh, Maiden Choice Lane, um, uh, which is like uh, Maiden Choice Apartments, which are like really co close to campus. They are just 10 minutes walk. And a little bit far further away from that, there is Westlands Community. Uh, Westland Community and Maiden Choice Apartments are the best if you want to take um, close to the campus. But as the Indian communities like uh, really huge the competition and the, the like supply and demand for those apartments is also like the supply is large uh, mm. I mean the demand for it is huge so uh, a lot of people grab those as soon as they get the university if they're getting coming into UMBC they check out for Westland apartments or they check out for maiden choice apartments but further away from the campus there's also Mount Ridge apartments Montrose uh, apartments um and the community around yep got it got it and for the from these uh different communities i'm pretty sure there must be some public transport for people to travel from the to and fro to the university right so mm -hmm. how is the public transport uh is it particularly safe to travel in night mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you could talk about that yeah so baltimore is not really a safe place to be traveling at nights um, I would say that avoid public transport because we have university transit and university transit takes you to all these communities that I just told you guys. Um, it has a nice um, transit system. It has like five or six routes um, in the bus service, which is really handy. Like you have the service starting at seven in the morning, going all the way up to 11 o'clock at, at night. So those are the times like you can safely go out in Baltimore and come back. Um, so yeah, I, I would not advise, uh, going out during the night, but in the mornings, it's definitely like safe and going in these transit, you couldn't be safer. Got it. Got it. Thank you for sharing that. Now moving yeah. on to the next point, which is about, uh, on-campus jobs. Once people figure out they're living, I think the next thing probably they, or even before the thing that they, they is on their mind is on-campus jobs. So how is the situation with on-campus jobs in Baltimore? Uh, is you it easy to get, mm -hmm. difficult to get? And if you have any tips, which people yeah. use. UMBC is uh, great for campus jobs. There are a lot of campus jobs. You can work at dining. You can work as a desk assistant. And if you're lucky enough, you can work as like a graduate assistant, um, a teaching assistant, research assistant. There are so many positions out there. Um, I would say to get a part-time job as soon as you come to the US, you would have to come maybe a month before like your course actually starts. That's a really handy tip because um, I think you have you can legally come to the US 60 days or 30. I could be wrong. It could be mm -hmm. 30 or 60 I think days. it's 30 days, yeah. Yeah, 30 days. So come like on the 29th day or something like that and use all that time to make new connections with seniors um, who are already there on campus because you can apply all you want on um, Handshake and the job portals that they have, but usually like it's only 10% chances of getting picked. 
um, mm-hmm. through these portals. Everything works through networking and knowing people who already work there, who can refer you to the same, um, let's say there's a, a teaching assistant and there's a, a person working under a professor. When he's leaving, he can actually recommend someone else uh, for the same position saying he's my friend, he um, knows this topic really well or something. And it goes the same with dining and other like campus jobs as well. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes sense. That makes sense. In case of uh, TA or RA jobs, if you let's say happen to secure one of these, would that uh, lead to getting some concession in your fees, uh, overall tuition fees? Definitely. So uh, once you get a TA or an RA, RA depends um, upon the professor, it's purely how much he, if he wants to pay you a stipend, it could be like only a stipend or he could be like stipend plus um, some, um, you know, he could give you a concession on the fees. But for TA, um, they have guidelines, a university like policies um, that you have to be in state tuition. It doesn't have to be out state. So in state tuition, you save like, two thirds of the money you were about to spend. So it's really good. And if you get a full-time teaching assistant position, that's like even better. Like you're just going to probably spend, my bill was around 1,000, 1,500 per semester for the tuition fee, which is like really great. (laughs) That's good. That's good. And I think that's a good segue to our point around the overall cost of master's. So if you have to split or give me a total cost of master's at UMBC, how much that would be like, how much would be the total fees for two years and how much would be the living expenses for two years? Right. Um, so for fee, um, it is like for computer science department, um, it is 12,500, something like that um, for a semester. So like stretching it out over four semesters, that becomes 50,000. Um, US dollars, which is around 40 lakhs uh, Indian currency. Um, And for uh, like living expenses, you obviously have the rent. Rents are really cheap in Baltimore, especially around the campus. There, you would be paying around 300, 350 per uh, month, which is really, really cheap. Um, And total living expenses come around to 500, 550 which are, if you stretch it out, it's like 12,500 for the entire um, course, which is around um, 10 lakhs. So within 50 lakhs, you could do a, realistically, you could do a master's here. Got it. Got it. And if you happen to get a TA or RA, yeah. so that would drop it, drop the 50,000 fees to around how much? It would basically cost you $10,000, which is yeah. like 8 lakhs. 8 lakhs, right? Yeah, yeah. I know I have, I have, a, I, I made a video, I think probably mm-hmm. last year, where how to do your master's less than 20 lakh. Right. So I think right. if you get a TA and RA, then 10 lakh for the uh, tuition and 10 lakh mm-hmm. for the living expenses, I think probably you would be able to do it within. Oh, and you get a stipend too. So And you get a stipend too. So your living expenses are pretty much zero if you yeah. do it the right way. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great uh, tip for all of you guys who who is watching. Look for universities where if you get a TARA, uh, you get a waiver in your tuition fees, and probably uh, just to top that, you get a you know a stipend every month. So definitely look for those universities. Uh, now moving on to the next topic of uh, on courses, right? Now I have a very strong belief that. Out of generally, there are like 10 courses that you will take over a period of two years. Out of those, there are these two or three courses which really make a lot of difference in your resume. Like they add value to your resume in terms of new skills, new projects, um, new publications, and things of that nature. So, what were those two or three courses which you would definitely recommend for anybody who is watching and who is planning to come to take? Um, I would say like de- it depends on your career choices and the path that you want to take. Uh, most of the courses which are really good are optional to take. Some people do take it, some people don't. 
So if you were like a data science, if you wanted to go into data science and data positions, it would be something like at UMBC, um, NLP is really good, um, the natural language processing course, and also introduction to data science by Professor Manas Gaur. Um, and there's for software engineering, I would say service oriented computing is a good course. Um, and so uh, structured system design and analysis is another good course. Um, and data visualization across any industry, you could take that course. It uh, They have like real life projects that they do uh, with external clients uh, by Professor Don Engels. So, data visualization is also good. Got it. Got it. Thank you for sharing that. Now, moving mm -hmm. to the last point uh, for our today's conversation, which is about internships and jobs. So, I know you probably did most of your master's in COVID times or mm -hmm. half of your master's in uh, COVID times. So, how was your experience? How did it affect the internship search experience where you were to get an internship? How was the situation with your roommates or with your classmates? If you could share about that. Um, so for internships, I wouldn't say Baltimore is the like ideal location you want to be because it's close to uh, DC uh, where all the federal um, buildings and organizations are. Um, and it's called the DMV area, um, DC, Maryland, and Virginia. These are like all the contracts given to companies are DOD, Def Department of Defense, uh, contracts or like defense contracts. So they wouldn't give to international students. They would prefer um, citizens because it needs clearance. Um, I would say like for internships, start looking um, in New York, New Jersey, which are close by here and Boston or even like Tex in Texas or West Coast. Um, it's not that people don't get in Maryland. They do get it too, um, but it's not you know, as fancy in a software um, company like you would see in West Coast or whatever. Um, and coming to jobs, it's the same situation. You can still get a job in Maryland. Um, if you really like the place, um, you can uh, end up settling in Maryland. But um, I would suggest just for an entry-level job, moving to a different city with better um, software companies around so that you boost your chances of getting good jobs. And obviously, uh, back in COVID times, there was like rage hiring. Everyone was hiring and everyone was getting internships. Right now, market is not doing so well, uh, obviously. And um, I mean, everyone's looking to the Fed rate hikes and uh, like interest rates and stuff like that um, and big tech hiring and stuff. So you would be better with jobs either in the West Coast or Texas or in the East Coast, it is New Jersey, New York, and Boston. Got it. Got it. Well, thank you so much for patiently answering all of these questions, Paul. Um, that's all we had for today. Uh, anyone who is watching, definitely share your favorite tip from today in the comment section below. Uh, my favorite tip, and which I personally also uh, recommend a lot of people from this conversation was that if you really want to get on-campus job, come or land in US one month before. And you might have heard me saying this a lot of times in different videos or different similar podcasts, but that that is my favorite tip from you, Paul. So thank you for that. Uh, uh, Thanks, until... Nitin. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, for sure. Pleasure is mine. Um, and for all of you who are watching, definitely share and subscribe this video. And I will see you in the next podcast.